Does, yeah, great. Hello, everyone. My name is Philip Nikolic, and great to see the entire room so full. So, my talk is going to be demystifying eBPF. I want to do so by writing an eBPF firewall from scratch with you today here. And the reason why I want to do that is because inside of the CNCF landscape, we see an increasing demand for eBPF. Lots and lots of projects are actually going to either already start with eBPF implementing from the very beginning or tend to go over to it because of some of the advantages that we'll see in this talk. Just to name a few, there is Falco, which does security monitoring. There is Pixie, which you can use in order to observe network traffic inside of your Kubernetes cluster. And there is Cilium, which does a bit of everything, but is mainly on the networking part. So in order for you to first truly understand what eBPF is and why we want to use it, I'll start out very simple. Think about any application that's currently running on any of your systems. This can be a self-written Go application, or it can be your favorite um, open, source, open source web server. Such Oh, uh, we're back again. Sorry for the delay. So think about your favorite application, whether that's a self-written one or any one that you actually are hosting on some of your systems right now. All of these applications, regardless of what you now thought of, are running most likely in user space. It's important to understand what the user space is. Pretty much everything that you ever did, you have done so far in user space. The name user space may already suggest that there is different spaces. For example, there is something called the kernel space as well. This is where the Linux kernel resides in. So the Linux kernel is an application on its own, and it is running in a different space than your usual applications. And this is important for a couple of reasons. You can think of the best way to think about the Linux kernel is about your friend and helper. It's going to do certain tasks that you don't want to bother with. And some of those important tasks are hardware management. So every system has NICs, every system has disks, and so on. So every time that you want to do something with a network interface card, by, for example, sending out traffic over the network, or reading things from a disk, or accessing memory, CPU, whatever it is, all of these things essentially are going through your friend and helper, the Linux kernel. Since the kernel itself is an application as well, we somehow need a way to communicate with it. So how do we do this, for example, in a microservice architecture with application A and application B? Somehow these two applications want to communicate with each other. A common pattern would be a REST API. And so in order for your user space applications to communicate with the kernel, we do have an interface as well. This is called the system call interface. We're using this interface all the time, whether you actually realize it or not. Oftentimes, it's hidden away from you if you use high-level languages, such as Go, for example. But regardless of what you do, there will always be certain syscalls invoked when you want to access hardware devices. For example, when would you want to do that? Let's assume you have a Go application that is going to open a file in order to read from it. So for you, as a software engineer, you will only have an os.open. It's one line of code. But underneath, what will happen is a bunch of syscalls. There's only a limited amount of syscalls inside of the Linux kernel that it exposes to you. But everything that you want to do when you need to do certain things will go over those syscalls. So to keep with the example, you want to read a file. The open syscall is being triggered. So the open syscall is being triggered, and the kernel now knows what to do, will access the disk for you, and return you whatever it is that you want. In the same sense, when Nginx starts, it wants to also get network data to be able to receive it and to be able to send it out again. So it needs to connect to a network socket. And this is the network syscall. So as we can see, there always is 
the Linux a kernel as a bridge between your applications and the hardware devices that you want to use. And understanding this gives better inspect into a better insight into why eBPF is such a fundamental instrument and is being used more and more. Because being able to know all of that, we can now go ahead and write eBPF programs. eBPF programs are very secure programs that run inside of the kernel space. So unlike all programs that you've most likely written so far, they truly do live inside of the kernel space. And in order for there to not be certain issues, it must be guaranteed that it's very safe. So eBPF has a verifier that is going to scan your application, and it will try to traverse through each and every possibility that there is, and try to find out if there is something that could crash the application or not. If so, it's not going to allow you to load it in. What do you have? root permissions or not, it doesn't care about that. If it is not safe, it will not allow you to run your eBPF program inside of the kernel space. So eBPF is an event-driven mechanism. What does that mean? There's lots of hooks that you can use. And one of those hooks is what I talked about, syscalls. So you can have an eBPF program as shown here, that is going to be attached to the open syscall. Every time the dead hook is triggered, the eBPF program will run. Based on that, you can then make certain decisions. What do you mean by decisions? For example, you could um, have So, oh, we're back again. All right. Um, so what we can do is we can write an eBPF program that is going to run every time that the open syscall is being triggered. And then we can, for example, have a list of all applications that open a certain file. For example, you're wondering, hey, there is a file foo.txt. I've never seen it. I don't know where it's from, I'm seeing it's over 10 years old. I don't have a clue if an application needs it or not. Can I freely remove it, yes or no? The people that created it left the company already. No clue. An eBPF program may help with this because it can simply run all the time and you can then check, is this file still needed or not? In the same sense, we could do this with connect syscalls as well. For example, to find out if a new application could be malicious by sending data outside of the network, although it's not supposed to do that. So there's lots of things that we can attach. The one thing that I want to focus on today is a different kind of hook. The hook that I want us to focus right now for this talk is something called XDP. It is an abbreviation that stands for Express Data Path. In essence, what we will do is we will have, we'll write an eBPF program that will act as a firewall and will attach it to the NIC itself, so to a specific interface. Every traffic that comes in on that specific interface will then be observed by our eBPF program. And based on that, we can make decisions whether we want to drop it or pass it on. So to further emphasize on this example, let's imagine we have two systems. On the left-hand side, you can see a Go application running on system A. And on the right-hand side, some kind of web server, let's say Nginx, running on a different system. So the Go application wants to access the Nginx host on the different system. So it will send traffic over its NIC and it will be incoming on the other NIC. And that other NIC on the side of Nginx is, is exactly where we want our eBPF program to be attached to. And then, based on that, we'll make certain decisions. So here is a very simple eBPF program. eBPF programs are mainly written in C. So we'll now go over this very short example. It is an example 
that acts as a firewall. Admittedly, not a good one, but we'll get to it eventually. In less than six lines, in less than uh, 10 lines of code, we already have an entire working firewall, even if it doesn't do much. So the first line simply defines a section. It defines a section. This is important as it presents to us metadata information. This metadata information will, once we compile it, be important in order to find out what exactly it is that we want to run. To keep it simple here, you can think of it as just the name of your application. After a section, you will then have a function. Let's keep it simple as well. Just think of this as your main function. So any time that this program will now run, this function will be triggered. Everything inside of it, similar to a main function when we run it, will be triggered. And now, inside of our function, we simply return xtp underscore pass. So all this will now do is it takes in every packet, it doesn't even do anything, and just passes it on. And this is, admittedly, a very bad example for a firewall, but we'll get there. So if we now attach it to the NIC, this is exactly how this picture would look like. We have our Go application, it sends over some data, and on the incoming side, we have our eBPF program. Every time something comes in, the eBPF program will evaluate it and will check, does it uh, fit or not? In our case, we simply pass on everything. So the NGINX server will receive whatever it is that it will receive. All right, so a firewall actually is supposed to drop things, right? So how can we do this? In essence, very simple. Here is a, it's pretty much the same code, but just with a couple of changes. And in here, we simply have in line five, return xtp underscore drop. Simple so far, right? Now, all of what this is going to do, once we load it in, is it is going to drop all the packets already before it can be evaluated by Nginx. Nginx doesn't even see it, doesn't notice it. And lots of the kernel stuff as well does not even ever get to know it. Because of that, because we do all of this on the interface card itself, it is extremely fast. It is probably the fastest option that we have as of right now to deal with those things inside of the kernel. But this is not really useful if we think about a real world example. Coming here today and connecting to the Google Wi-Fi, I actually saw that the Google Guest Wi-Fi only provides me with IPv6, um, which was a bit of an issue because certain unfortunately. So instead, I had to redo things and connect to something that was allowing me to deal with IPv4. So for our example, for our final draft, what I would like to show you is how we can make decision, decisions inside of our firewall, inside of our program. And what we're going to do is we will want to have something that is going to basically find out the protocol and then if it is IPv6, drop it as was the case with me today, as I had to experience, unfortunately. So the beginning, again, is exactly the same. But what we now added is some kind of way to find out the protocol. So we'll simply find out the protocol and assign it to a variable. Once we have that, we can have a very simple if condition. If the protocol is something that we do not want, we want to drop it. Everything else is supposed to pass. I want to say that this here right now is pseudocode. The previous examples, you could take, copy paste it, and it would run. This here is pseudocode just to emphasize on this, but we'll get to the real world example now. But in order to understand how we can find out the protocol, I first have to dive in in a very, very quick thing, how network protocols work. So when we think about network protocols, in essence, they are stacked. We do have those different layers, and we start at a very low layer. A very low layer would be an Ethernet frame. 
And an Ethernet frame consists of primarily two things, an Ethernet header and a payload. Inside of the payload is then the next layer. So the payload carries our IP packet. And the IP packet, on the other hand, would then carry, for example, TCP or UDP or whatever it is that you want. And this is how those things are layered. So you have one protocol which has a payload, and this payload is exactly what happens to be the next protocol. The Ethernet header somehow, however, needs to know what protocol is inside of the payload. Why does it need to know so? Well, because, so, uh, because the recipient needs to know how to interpret these things. So it must know, is the next, uh, is the next protocol going to PIPv4? Is it going to be IPv6? And so on. So there actually is a tiny piece of information inside of the Ethernet header that is going to tell us exactly what the next protocol is. So to put this into perspective and into uh, an example that does work, here is how our final code will look like. In order for us to be able to drop IPv6 packets, we'll have to do something like the following. We'll define a couple of variables. This may sound a bit confusing to people that are not used to working with pointers or uh, program and C, but in essence, it's very simple. On the right-hand side, we see a variable called ctx context. This context has data in it. Data simply tells us where something is starting. And we do also have something where the data ends. So everything in between it basically is our packet. Now the question is, how exactly can we now find out what it is that we want? Now that we have the starting point and the end point of our packet, we can simply divide things into our header and payload as previously shown on the slide. And we do this in line seven. So in line seven, we'll now take the packet start and define it as an Ethernet, Ethernet um, header type. By doing so, we'll now have access to the Ethernet header and the data in it. For reasons that I mentioned previously, that eBPF must be secure and safe, we also need to implement a safety check here. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to attach it to one of our NICs. So how we're going to do this is by actually checking if the beginning of the packet and the size of the entire Ethernet is out of bound by checking if it is going further than the end of the packet or if it is within the bounds. The reason why we have to do so is because if we were to go over it, we would access memory that doesn't belong to us. And this is very dangerous. If you are able to do this, you've successfully, uh, you've successfully We need to ensure that the memory addresses that we want to access are within the bound of just our packet and not before or after that. And the if condition is going to do exactly that. So if it was to go over that bound, we will have to drop it. Everything below it now means is inbound. And so the verifier is going to pass on our example. So what can we do now? Now, similar to our pseudocode, we can take a variable, define it, and call it protocol. And now, inside of the Ethernet header, we'll simply check what the next protocol is, because it is stated there. Now that we know what the next protocol is, we can simply go ahead 
and check if the protocol is something that we do not want. In our particular case, IPv6. As you can see on the left hand side, we do have protocol, then equals equals, and on the right hand side, ethernet underscore protocol underscore IPv6. Before that, we also have something very special. We have a function called VPF underscore HTONS. The reason why we need to do this is because our eBPF program is attached directly to a network interface card. If we think about those two systems to talk to each other, on one system, the entire packet with all of those protocols is being built. And in the end, everything is just a sequence of zeros and ones. And usually, we read them, for example, in a Western world, we read things from left to right, correct? But there is languages where you read from right to left. And depending on how you now are going to send things, it may happen that you will actually send it in a wrong order. So all of the information that we actually do receive is, so to speak, in the wrong order. So we'll have to once flip it around. This is exactly what this function bpf underscore hdons does. So in essence, it takes the host byte order and flips it so that we can have an exact thing that we can then compare. And if this equals, we are going to drop our packet because it means it's IPv6. And if it isn't, we're going to pass it on. Hopefully this example gives you insight onto how these things can work and how firewalls can be written using eBPF. If we were to extend this example, we could as well check for source IP addresses. We could perform things on TCP, UDP layer, and so on, whatever we want. We could check for certain ports exactly like your common firewalls right now would do. And this is how we would do it by writing an eBPF program for it. So, the outcome of our thing would basically be system A, our Go application, is trying to send something over its NIC and it gets into the reversed order onto our NIC on system B. Our eBPF program is then going to check whether it is IPv6 or not. If it is, it's going to drop those packets. And if it wasn't IPv6, it's going to pass it on. So IPv4 is going to continue to work. And even if it wasn't just IPv6, IPv4, whatever it is, all other packets would still pass. All we had to do right now was drop IPv6. So to summarize, and hopefully to give you some ideas of what you can take with you from this talk, eBPF is event-driven. There is lots and lots of events the ones I've referred to in this call, for example, would be syscalls, as well as XTP, which is what we used on the network interface card. Because of all of these events, and there is many, many more that we can use, it is extremely versatile, and it can be used in a wide range of scenarios, such as observability, security, networking, and so on and so forth. Also, because it runs in a kernel, and it will be basically compiled in a very efficient manner, it is extremely fast. As well, because it doesn't have to go through as many things as other, perhaps, user space applications have to. Once your user space application makes a decision on a packet, it means that the packet already had to run through millions of lines of code inside of the Linux kernel. So if we were able to have be safe and sound to do all of these things in order to receive the benefits. As you can see, if we weren't to do that, it could exploit a lot of the things that we know and love about Linux. And so the initial design of eBPF really was done in a way so that everything is as secure as possible. 
you cannot simply write things and the kernel is going to run them for you. The kernel will actually reject it if it wasn't secure enough. This is why we need to do certain checks. This is why, for example, you cannot code everything exactly as you wanted to. Even if you were a proficient C software engineer, you couldn't just write exactly in the same way as you wanted to. It's a restricted uh, subset of C. So uh, loops, for example, cannot work infinitely because it must be verified that everything runs in a certain speed and will be ac uh, will exit at some point. And as well, the reason for this talk is basically the increasing popularity of eBPF. I found it hard to find many resources out there that actually show you the code and how it can be written. And so this is why I came up with those couple of examples and hopefully some of you will try them out at home. This concludes my talk, and yeah, if you have any questions either now, feel free to ask them. Otherwise, you can also reach out to me some other point in time, and yeah, over LinkedIn or try to find me on a conference. I'm happy to answer questions if there are any. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> question over here. My friend. Yeah. Not on. Yeah, sorry. Um, so my question is, I, I've only ever um, written little toy eBPF programs that mm -hmm. I got to run on my own machine mm -hmm. in my very specific Linux VM, whatever. Okay, so I'll, I'll repeat the question because the mic's on right now. Um, so the question essentially was how trivial or hard it is to have an eBPF program, write it, and be able to distribute it on a bunch of different kernel versions and distributions, correct? Yeah. In essence, the distributions itself do not matter that much as long as it's truly the Linux kernel itself. But now comes the difficult part. It is running inside of the kernel, and so with that, being the case, the kernel version does matter a lot. So unfortunately, there is certain things in that regard that um, you want to be able to compile it once and run it everywhere, similar as we know it with other languages. And while this is still something that is being worked on more and more, there is effort already been put in place to accomplish this, and it does work to a certain extent. However, to be honest with you, in essence, it really is quite bound to certain things. Not as bad as kernel modules, but as the community grows more and more, there is a more clear definition of what are stable APIs and what aren't. And it also depends on the EPPF program that you run. So I gave an example of certain things that are relatively stable. The open syscall is always gonna be called open. The connect syscall is always gonna be called connect, right? But you can also attach eBPF programs to exact kernel functions. And those function names can totally change from one version to the other. So if you were to do certain kernel tracing, for example, you may actually have to change your program every time that you update the kernel because those things are not stable. The kernel always only guarantees you that everything that faces the user side is stable. So yeah, it truly really depends on kind of the use case and what your eBPF program exactly does um, with certain things. It will be very simple to port them across different versions and across different distributions, whatever it is that you want onto many machines and also do your updates won't be an issue. With certain kernel inside things, it will be more of an issue. Hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> Let's try, yes. Uh, I was wondering, is it possible for eBPF programs to have state and perform decisions across multiple packets? 
Yeah, uh, good question. So in regards to state, this is something due to the time restriction of 30 minutes I couldn't entirely put in. I would have also wanted to show you exactly how you can attach those programs and so on and so forth. But in essence, yes, it is possible to have state. Maps now may sound a bit like hash maps or dictionaries in certain program languages, and while they can act like those things, um, really the best way to just think about them is persistent storage. That's exactly it. And you can have an eBPF program write to a map some kind of information. For example, we could have done in our uh, firewall, we could have counted the amount of packets that we dropped. And we would have written that to an BPF map. And the fascinating thing about it is that other eBPF programs can then as well access this particular map. And based on that, you can make decisions. But it goes even a step further. This BPF map can also be accessed from your user space applications as well, if you have the right access to them. And this is exactly how things like, for example, uh, Falco, Cilium, and so on work. There is an application in user space that runs on Kubernetes that actually checks, checks all the pods and the services and the endpoints and so on, and writes those things to a BPF map. And the BPF program then reads the data from that map and makes decisions based on that. Hopefully, this gave a bit of insight to storage. Yes, thanks. Yep. Okay, thank you very much. I'm sorry for the technical difficulties. Uh, receiver box just literally died during the speech, so that was unprepared. Sorry for that. Um, there's going to be a 15-minute break, like a really short one, and then we have another track in here over there as well. And uh, after that is lunch. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you very much.